I'll also do is um, talk to you a little bit about that process towards the end of the session. We are recording this session this evening. Um, I've just hit record now. Um, so what I will do is also send this out um, tomorrow morning. Um, Housekeeping wise, if you've got questions throughout the session, please feel free to pop them into the chat. I'm going to be monitoring that whilst Dave is speaking. Dave's gonna talk for about 35 or so minutes um, about uh, coming up with story ideas, his storytelling process and getting that idea down on paper. Um, and he's also gonna share some slides and some information. I'm going to have all of that to distribute to you. So you don't need to make notes. You can literally sit back, listen and enjoy. Um, the other thing is towards the end when we do have time for questions, depending on how many we have, I might ask them to Dave directly, um, or I might open it up and uh, get us all having a chat together on screen. So I'll just wait and see um, as we go along how many questions we're getting through and if we wanna get through all of them. And finally, I'm going to hand over to Dave now. Um, David and I have known each other for quite some time um, and have worked together on a number of different projects uh, when I used to work in Queensland. And uh, I thought, who better to host this session tonight? One of the things that I admire most about David's writing process is his ability to capture a really authentic story. Um, and I think one of the projects I've been long admiring of Dave's is the work that he does uh, in community in Mount Isa, where he's been working on a project over a number of years now, I think, Dave, with, um, with that project and taking a community story and turning it into quite an epic, uh, epic piece of theatre. So you can read all about all of the amazing things David has done in his bio and all of his books, and I'm sure he'll brag about it at some point in time in the session. And if he doesn't, I will make him. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to David Burton. Thanks so much, Heidi. Hello, everyone. How are you? Uh, it's, this is weird. Uh, but some people are doing the like Zoom version of applauding, which is lovely. And thumbs upping. Love it. How are you all? It's good. This is, I don't know what else to say other than this is weird, but I'm really happy to be here with you. These are actually my favourite type of events. When, it's, when the world isn't ending, where we just get to gather together and talk about storytelling for no other reason than that's a fun thing to do. Um, I'm from Brisbane. I'm in Coffs Harbour at the moment because of life happening. Um, Heidi and I have known each other for some time. I've spent a lot of time in Melbourne, some time in Frankston. Um, and, and I you know, want to thank Heidi and um, the Frankston Arts Centre is you know obviously a fantastic institution for you guys and in this time it's really interesting to see how different arts organizations are responding to the weirds um and different projects are coming forward and things like this are a great opportunity for people who have got a really diverse range like some of you may have never thought about creative writing before some of you may be great you might have publishing history or experience um, and, and to kind of open the doors and say all are welcome, let's celebrate work and look at work um, is a really fantastic thing. So uh, with, the, with the time that we've got, I've, I've done a few of these things um, over, uh, I, I've done a few lectures at a university level um, and one of the things that becomes apparent, I can just see in chat, someone can't hear me, please. If there's other people who can't hear me, let me know. Uh, I've got my mic receiving well. Heidi, let me know if there's oh, a tech issue. Um, what I've found is that normally, if we had an hour together, I'd pause for exercise, like we might write some things together and share some things in zoom that just ends up feeling a bit awkward and a bit clumsy what i have found kind of boringly to be the best solution is that i just talk at you <laughs> and and i'll probably talk quite quick because i, I want to get you as much information as possible in the time that we have and then you can go back and look at this later i'm going to give you different exercises to do that you can with your judgment, go, that one sounds crap. I don't want to do that one, Dave. I'll do this one instead and I'll modify it to be this or whatever you need. Because um, really, this is about you guys and whatever whatever you want to get out of it. So with that in mind, I'll share screen. And here's where I reveal myself to be a Luddite. And suddenly, um, oh, 
interesting. The host has disabled attendee screen sharing, I'm afraid, Heidi. Okay. That's a... Well, that's fun. <laughs> so I'm going to talk for a bit longer while Heidi figures that I'm out. I'm going to work out. This, will... this, this is going to be exciting. Let me see what I can do. <laughs> That's all right. I just don't want you looking at my face the whole time. You um, so, um, so I can talk initially a little bit about who I am. So I'm me. Hello. And I'm um, a professional writer and I've been a professional writer for a, a dozen or more years. Um, and in the arts, of course, we don't tend to, most of us don't tend to be able to create a sustainable income off our art. Some years I have, which is great, and other years I haven't. And the other thing I tend to do is be a teacher um, at a university level, and I'm, I'm a couple of months off my doctorate, um, achieving my doctorate. But my creative work is mostly based in theatre. A lot of the time I've written about over 30 professionally produced plays, and some of those are the work that Heidi's talking about, which is really specific community-engaged plays that have a whole kind of litany of practice to them that I can blab at you about some other time. A lot of them are youth and education work. So a lot of my scripts end up in schools and some of those big ones have been um, April's Fool. Um, thanks, Heidi. I think I can do that now. Let's see. Boop, 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 boop. I got another, hey, look at that. Hey, <laughs> thank <laughs> goodness that would, that would have been deathly embarrassing. <laughs> Just me staring. Does that work, Heidi? My screen, that's working beautifully, David. Thank you. Awesome. No worries. Thank you, mate. So, um, uh, do, 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 do. so uh, April's Fool uh, is the big script that tends to go into schools a lot. Um, there's other works. St Mary's and Egg Style was one of my main stage works for Queensland Theatre Company back in the day a couple of years ago. Um, the Man in the Water and How to Be Happy have been my two published books, both for young adult audiences. How to Be Happy is a memoir, which is good given what you're potentially writing about for Frankston Arts Centre. Um, and I know memoir for a lot of up and coming writers or people who have a creative writing in inkling inside them might tend to drift towards um, memoir often or not. Man in the Water is a young adult fiction novel about um, a crime. It's a crime novel about a dead body that turns up in the outback. Ooh, and then the body disappears. Ooh. Uh, so go have fun with that. Uh, but that's me. Um, but tonight we're gonna cover like the three big pillars of how we think about an introduction to storytelling when we write it. Now, this is a different workshop to what I would be giving you if you were in a theater context. It's a different um, workshop if I was doing a, a film and screenwriting workshop. I'm generally gonna be talking about prose. I'm generally gonna be thinking about short stories and novels and so on. But all of these same essential principles kind of apply across media because we're talking about storytelling broadly also. So ideas, where do they come from? How do we get them? Um, which is the kind of perennial question. Structure, which is once you get an idea, an idea is like a really hot date. It's like fantastic, awesome, that felt amazing. And then you go on a second or third or fourth date and then stuff really takes off, awesome. But most of the time, <laughs> it reaches a point where you go, oh, this is interesting. We've got to do some work here. We've got to figure out what's, what's the best path forward. And that's where you start thinking about structure. Because I find often people really find it easy to, to do a couple of hundred words, or maybe for some of you, it might be for me, the first 10,000, 15,000 words come really easily. And after that, there's a hinge point. I find for me, if I can get past 15,000 to 20,000 words, if I jump off that cliff, then the rest text tends to come easily. And for me, that's because that's where structurally things start to shift and I have to start thinking ahead a certain way. So anyway, we'll talk about that. And redrafting, which sadly uh, is something that everybody, yes, even you, has to go through. It's just part of professional practice, but it's also just worthy of your time and consideration. I was really resistant to redrafting for a long time um, because I've found writing very vulnerable because creative writing is a very vulnerable activity. Um, but I also just didn't know how to do it because no one kind of speaks about it. It feels 
ugly, it feels like the ugly cousin of creative writing, this idea that you've got to go back and do hard work, but it's not hard work. It's really fun, I find, to be able to go through and kind of have this mm, a bit of sweat and rigor in developing your work to get to a point where you go, oh my gosh, it's so much better and so much more articulate. So we'll talk about that. So let's talk about ideas. This is the thing that everybody thinks about. Ideas tend to come from when you're in a, now I'm gonna get sciencey on you here, which is awful because I'm not a scientist. And some of you are gonna have science backgrounds, so forgive me. But something interesting happens in the brain with genuine creative thought, right? It can't come at you when you're doing something that's really, um, that's really meticulous and all encompassing, right? So if you're a person who's in a high stress job and you find it hard to switch off from that high stress job or even just a high stress lifestyle, you may find it difficult to access that creative well. And it's because your brain is doing this. And we all know from those dreadful days of doing school assignments, or when I know we've got some young people here and you guys know better than anybody, that awful feeling of sitting down and going, I've got to be creative now. I've got to write an essay. I've got to do a thing. And you sit down and try and be creative. And of course, that's the, it's like, it's no movement at the station happens, right? Ideas tend to happen when our body is busy but our mind is relaxed. So showers, going for walks, doing the dishes, mundane household chores, where there's just enough activity happening that there's this kind of low hum in the brain of I'll do this and do, 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 do. And that's when I find that unlocks something. Other stuff starts to happen. 90% of my ideas, I've got to say, have got to have, happen in the shower. And I think it is just a relaxation thing. I think it is just hot water. Oh, nice. Your brain goes into somewhere else and something else happens. Right. And ideas, this is the thing other people don't talk about as well. Ideas ha can happen over a long time. Ideas might start as a weird, niggly kind of half thought and might take years, literally years, to kind of be there and play around in the background before they develop into something. You go, that's what I need to start writing about, you know. Because as I say, and we'll talk about structure, ideas are not story. Ideas are ideas. They're just the, they're not even the blueprint. It's like, it's, it's just a little spark. And you've got to work to capture that spark that takes time and a bit of thought right behind it because I've had some great ideas, awesome ideas. Boy, could I tell you about the ideas I've had and then I've sat down to do them, uh, to write them and they're kind of not there or they don't work or I get past the first sentence and I'm like, Oh, there's actually nothing there. I, I possibly some of you have had that experience as well. So I, we've got to push past that. However, there's this other thing that comes into our head which is all this rubbish, all this self-critiquing that might stand in our way as well. And for school students, and this gets drummed into you at school for good reason, but ultimately ends up being a bit damaging in the long run, how we get activity. is the right way and a wrong way and a good thing and a bad thing. And that's not the case. That's not the case. It's very easy to be snobbish and say there are bad stories. There are, there are bad books. Like everybody tends to get snobby about romance literature, for example, about Fifty Shades of Grey in particular. And yet you can't ignore the fact that that genre is incredibly popular and means a lot to a huge amount of people, right? And it's the same with all the genres, sci-fi and fantasy. There are those on the outside going, that's not good writing. But of course it is. It's good writing if it captures someone and if it makes them passionate and if it switches them on and makes them feel um, alive and, and makes them wanting more, right? And that means that there's no good and bad stories. There's just stories that need to find their audience, right? Um, and and so that's one of the key things that gets in people's head, that there's good and bad and right and wrong. And I spend so much time as a university lecturer getting that out of young people's heads, that there's no right or wrong. There's just interesting and more interesting or less interesting, right? And part of your job as a writer is to make the more interesting choice, to figure out what's the more interesting thing to do. What's going to be the thing that will keep people reading? 
Elizabeth Gilbert. Now, speaking of if you're a snob or not, people either tend to be in the Elizabeth Gilbert camp or not. She's a bit much at times, but she's cool and she's written a fantastically accessible book on creativity and has a TED talk. And she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which was a huge hit now uh, quite a while ago. And I, it was a really important book for me. And she's a bit hit and miss in her writing style, I find, but she's really an articulate voice on creativity and ideas in particular. Here's some of the things that she's like. Here's 10 ideas or 10 kind of things to get your head around pardon me, when you're thinking about creativity. All ideas are looking for a partner to act on. You need to kind of, it, it's a helpful psychological idea to not think that you are the onus of genius, right? That's an incredible amount of pressure to put on one person. But instead, if you go a bit woo-woo and go, there are ideas kind of floating around in the atmosphere and one of, and those ideas will come to different people at different times and I've kind of got to channel that and think about it. It helps if the idea is a little separate from you because that means you can critique it. That means that if it doesn't turn anything, you, you don't feel like you've done a bad job, right? Um, because creativity can be a, a full on intense experience for a lot of people. It's okay if other people don't like what you create. In fact, I'm going to, you know, pop your balloon right now. People are definitely not going to like what you create. There's all sorts that if you're a published writer, the worst thing you can do is go on to Goodreads, <laughs> which I've done from time to time, particularly if you've written a memoir, say, about your life and you look at reviews and watch people who make comment on not just your writing, but who you are, that's good fun. But if you can get past the idea that people don't try and please other people, right? Just try and be honest about the idea you're creating. Choose love over fear as a part of that. Don't, don't try and take risks. Try and kind of fall into it. Take creativity as your secret boyfriend or girlfriend, as the person you want to dance with, right? You're allowed to creative entitlement. For many of us who are busy and lead other full lives where we're parents or school students or we have full-time jobs, at a certain point, the idea is going to have to take time for you and you're entitled to that time. Of course, you're allowed to take time. You're allowed to take half an hour out of your day to go, I'm just going to be creative now. I'm just going to write or do my music or paint. For some people, that's a huge thing to be able to give themselves permission to do that because in their head, creativity is silly or whatever. It hasn't been done by you yet. This is so key. A lot of people get an idea and start writing and then go, oh, it's just like somebody else has done this thing already. And of course they have. Listen, everyone has done everything before. In some way, there's no new stories, right? I can do a whole separate lecture on story types and all that kind of stuff. But it hasn't been done by you. And you're going to do it in your way and an interesting way right? And that's what's important. Lighten up. Don't take it too seriously. Remember, this is supposed to be fun, right? Creating is a, is a creative thing. It's a positive thing. Um, done is better than perfect. Don't stress about getting it right. Just try and get it done. Follow your curiosity. That's the key thing to generating ideas. It's just about what you hear. We have access to the entirety of human knowledge, all of us, it's the great equaliser at any given time. So if you find yourself with a question, if you find yourself going, you know, I remember once learning about the Greek myths, but I'd love to go and splash around in that pool a bit more than go. Or many of you will have hobbies already that point a curious idea for you. Some of you may have intensive hobbies in ancestry or all sorts of things, right? And there, or history, and you can go for broke looking at that. That's where you've got to follow your curiosity. And it's not dumb. If you're a 15-year-old boy and your curiosity is Fortnite and video games or um, football or anything, right? That's valid. I'm here to tell you that's valid. Just follow that. Look into that. Go behind the creation of the video game or go behind the lives of the sports people or go into, you know, how they make Marvel movies and what are the superhero myths and what is the mythology of all of that? Follow that, lead that, because that's really important. Um, and make room for creativity every day, as I've said. So one of the things, and I think Heidi may talk about this more at the end, some of you have already submitted to the Frankston thing. A lot of you, I think the Frankston prompt is about 500 words. 
and it's about writing um, potentially from your life, although not necessarily, but I think a lot of you may lean towards nonfiction. I find that in these kinds of workshops, a lot of people tend to be interested in memoir or, or kind of have a loose affiliation with it. The first thing to understand is no, you're not boring. Your story is worth shaping. However, it will need shaping, but no, fundamentally, of course, you have something to share. And of course, there's interesting things that are worth sharing. However, the most interesting pieces are the ones that have the most vulnerability attached to them. And the most difficult pieces to write are the ones that require the most vulnerability. And in memoir, that's a really tough um, weight to balance because you need to be mentally healthy and you need to look after yourself and practice good mental hygiene. But at the same time, we know as readers and as viewers that what we love is when somebody has the strength to step forward and be vulnerable. And I could tell you many things about things I did right when I wrote my memoir and things I did wrong and I regret when I wrote my memoir. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind, that if you are writing from your life and you're writing about things that have a dark underbelly to them, then you need to protect yourself and do that in the right way. However, it is also a great therapeutic exercise and you don't need to publish it. You know, you don't need to. So I encourage journaling and all those things. That's part of it as well and dreaming in that space, you know. So it's it's a difficult balance to strike. Narrative is, exists even in mundanity. And this is the thing. If you're writing, say, for example, for Frank Stenart Center, and you're writing 500 words about what life in COVID-19 is like, if you look at your favourite writers, some of the fav my favourite literary writers, Annie Prue, Helen Garner, find the most exquisite detail in even the most mundane things. And of course, this is the thing that we're all struggling with, that suddenly our lives have shrunk to four walls and we're noticing things about our house and ourselves that we didn't before. You can describe, take some time to describe the mugs in your house and the chipped enamel or what the colour is on your walls that you've never really actually looked at and seen before or the dust that gathers in interesting places that you never really noticed or the movement that your cat makes because they have a routine through the day even when you're there versus when you're not there of how they interact with the space and where they find sunlight and all those interesting things, right? The more specific you make something, the more universal it becomes. One of the things that a lot of up and coming and emerging writers struggle with is they want to please everybody all the time. They want to try and be as broad as possible. And that means the mistake, the mistake they make is that the piece kind of ends up not feeling like it's got any guts. The more specific you make something, the more universal it becomes. One of the best selling memoirs, and she's got a Netflix special right now from the last 18 months was Michelle Obama's Becoming. And of course, Michelle Obama's led an incredibly unique, very, very specific life. And there's huge parts of her life that we can't relate to as readers. And yet, when she talks about her life in the White House, struggling with how to raise her kids and how to be a good wife and how to be a good leader and a good work, there's, of course, a ton of things in that that we can all relate to, right? Whether it's feeling pressured, whether it is that parenting relationship, whether it's that idea of how you digest news and current events or how you even exist in a romantic relationship that is under pressure and when you're time poor, or all of those things we can relate to. So the most specific thing is people will be able to relate to your story. So here's a couple of exercises I'm gonna throw at you super quick. Five senses, notice what you notice. Take some time to sit in your back garden, your front garden, on your kitchen floor, anywhere in your house, and just go through the five senses. That's all. And your goal here is to be precise. And in fact, if you are starting on an idea and you're stuck, then just take a moment to go, I'm gonna describe the character or I'm gonna describe the location and I need to look at all five senses. Sight and hearing is easy, right? Sight's really easy because it's the one we first noticed. Hearing is interesting, and all of a sudden, if you tune into what's going on in your ears for a second, you go, oh, I didn't realise there's, there's birds outside my window all the time that I don't notice, or smell, taste becomes fun because you don't think about it, but what is the, what's going on with that sensory experience? What can you, is there metallic taste left over from, um, or minty 
taste left over from your toothpaste this morning or is the coffee still in the back of your throat or what is going on for the character are they a smoker and when was the last time they smoked and can they still feel the heat on their lips or is there is there an urge in them with whatever's going on in the scene that they need to reach for another packet of cigarette or whatever you know what can you tell about your character by just getting very precise about the details and importantly these details might not end up in the final piece they might, but they might not, right? They might be edited out, but they might get you past a point or they might allow you entry into an idea where suddenly the world expands and what you're looking for is something to hook into, something to go, aha, that gets me another two or 300 words in because all of a sudden I'm going, ah, they're a smoker. How long have they smoked? Surely there's people in their life who've told them they shouldn't be smoking. What's their response to that? Are they spending a lot of money on it? What's their relationship to money? I haven't thought about the state of their bank account. What do they, you know, and suddenly you're in a whole other train of thought where you're filling in a part of their lives that was previously empty too. Okay, here's another exercise. So take, create a playlist or find someone else's and I've created one for you, Frankston. It's on Spotify and there's a link and at some point Heidi will throw that into chat or I can throw it into chat after. And it's just like random music, right? It's just like nine or 10 tracks of, random things. This is your goal. You're going to put them on and you're going to sit with paper and pen or a laptop or whatever, or a stone tablet and a chisel, whatever you want to write with. And you're going to press play on the first track. All you've got to do is think of a location. And again, focus on whatever the music makes you think of. You might hear a surf tune and think of a fifties beach party, or your brain might do a weird thing and suddenly think of a swamp. And you go, why would I think of a swamp to this music? That doesn't make sense. doesn't matter. Creativity is weird. Just go with it, right? Focus on the five senses. Describe the light. Describe the time of day, the weather. And that can be the exercise if you want. Or you can go deeper. You can go down to who's a character who definitely belongs in this space. If it's a 50s beach party, I'm thinking it's a... Uh, uh, a 19 year old um, swim trunk wearing tanned uh, surfer dude uh, who's um, got ma he's got the fifties like massive gel in his hair and he's um, and he's got a comb that he's constantly combing right cool and his name is Stephen a character who definitely doesn't belong in the place a elderly woman who's in a wheelchair, who is paralyzed from the waist down and somehow she's managed to get her wheelchair on the beach. And she is hot. She's inappropriately dressed. She's got a blanket and a rug. And then you just go write a scene where those two characters are talking to each other. Now, what this does is, and for more fun, if you want to go more, you can start to muck around with the time of day, the weather, or you can change the location. It's like, what changes in the scene if it's nighttime? Suddenly it's way scarier and way creepier if those two characters are on the beach and it's 1 a.m. and there's no one else around, right? That changes your scene to if it's 2 p.m. and the beach is crowded. Um, or you can change the location of the weather. Now, again, this is creativity, so there's no right or wrong, right? If I was doing this in a workshop, I'd only give you a minute and a half. My, my impetus would be to keep you you urgently writing, just not time. You've got to go through the exercise, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm going to start another track. And however far you get in that piece of music is however far you get. And I'm going to start another track. And that means you're going to think of a new location, a new person who belongs there, a new person who doesn't, right? You might decide to bugger that, David. I don't want to do that. I just want to listen to a piece of music, digest it and then write something at length and be relaxed about it. That's totally fine. If you need that pressure, go, I'm only going to have a minute and a half on each song and however far I get is however far I get. You might fall in love with the location and never get to the character. Or you might get to the character who belongs there and get stuck on them and find yourself writing their life history and go, hmm, turns out this person had an interesting thing happen to them when they were, you know, blah years old. I'm going to go write about that. Like all of that is allowed. Because of course it is, because it's you and a piece of paper and there's no rules, right? It's up to you. But this is just something to get the blah, 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 blah going, just to start that piece of your brain firing, right? 
So that's, that's an exercise I find useful because if you listen to 10 pieces of music and you listen to them over the course of 15 minutes, then you're gonna come out of that with at least one, at least one character that you're kind of interested in, that you kind of think is fun or um, makes you laugh or makes you go, oh, I didn't know where has that come from? That'll surprise you, right? So that's good fun. So you've got your ideas, right? Relax, go into it, lighten up, right? Run towards it and do whatever you need to do. Structure is the next thing. So you may get to the end of a thing and go, I've written this thing and I haven't thought about structure once. That's totally cool, of course. Most people, many people start and then think, that's the thing that I find for book length projects, for projects where you're writing 40,000 words or more, there's an incredibly romantic idea around writing novels and around writing long books. But the thing that I find stops most people from jumping over that ledge is that they get 5,000 or 10,000 words in and then they funnel that because it's a marathon, not a sprint and it's lonely work. And you're there by yourself in your own head for a long time to generate 50 plus thousand words. And a lot of the time I find as I talk about, it's that hinge point that people get stuck on. Any grade 10 English student will recognize this structure. Now this is a Western plot structure and this is not the structure to every story. However, because we live in a Western fueled society and most of our media and most of our culture is consumed uh, through these, through Western media, right? Big blockbuster films and the most successful books in Australia every year follow this structure. You may follow other stories from other cultures. You may follow anime. You may be a great fan of Murakami, who's a Japanese novelist. You might be a fan of um, Bollywood still follows this structure a lot of the time. Um, but Persian culture has a different approach to story. Um, Sri Lankan culture has a very interesting approach to story. Um, and listen, if anybody wants to do theatre nerd chat, theatre structure can go all over the place. But most of the time we go exposition, we go Harry Potter was a boy who lived under the stairs and then one day <gasps> there was an inciting incident where, where you're a wizard, Harry, and that's the inciting incident. Off we go into the story, right? Luke Skywalker goes, oh my goodness, my aunt and uncle are dead. I know what I'll do. I'll leave the planet. We have rising action all the way to the climax. The big kind of battle of wills. And then we go down into a denouement. And a denouement is a fancy French word. If you're in year 10 English, you've learnt resolution which is way too tidy for my taste because it feels like you've got to tie up everything. And a lot of the time you don't. A denouement is just like a, oh, a relax. The speed of the story slows down. Where, whoop, I jumped ahead. Oh, now I've got to go through all this. Sorry. Where, when we have a major blockbuster or best-selling book um, or movie, we are going expecting this structure. And when they don't deliver that structure, we want twists. We want enough surprises that we're left engaged, but not so many surprises that we feel that some promise has been broken because there's a promise in this structure. There's an idea planted. In the inciting incident, there's a promise. When Harry learns about who he is and his past, we know, we expect the climax to be his battle with Voldemort. That's what it's going to be. We know from the inciting incident of Star Wars that Luke is going to fight Darth Vader. And if we have any other ending, we're kind of going to be dissatisfied, right? In Frozen, we want... <laughs> I've got a two-year-old girl at home. We want Anna and Elsa to be together. We want the sisters to be reunited, right? And if they're not then you get a lot of angry parents going, why have you traumatised my child? When we get big series or big stories that break this structure or play with it a little too risky, then a lot of people get very angry <laughs> and they take the story structure very seriously, right? The masculine plot structure, the heroic plot structure, there's a lot of different words for it. The inciting incident makes a promise about the climax, right? Every scene or story beat has a mini plot structure in it. Every scene within that bigger structure has that same idea within it. There's a rising action and it 
gets to the top of the scene and we go off. The inciting incident's timing can depend on genre on, or medium. Sometimes it can be really early. Sometimes it's like page one and, oh my gosh, there's a dead body. What are we going to do? Or it might be a few chapters in, a few chapters into Outlander. She jumps through time and meets a sexy Scotsman, right? Rising action means rising action. This above everything is what gets people trapped, I find, is that trying to craft that slow escalation of tension. That's actually the mathematics of it. That's actually the fiddly bit that you've got to figure out because a lot of us know the climax and a lot of us know the inciting incident. And for that reason, a lot of us struggle to get past short story form, right? How to stretch that out over a longer form um, can be really challenging. This is, we're not going to spend long on this because I'm running out of time, but this is the heroic plot structure, right? And I encourage you to, this isn't my diagram, um, but you can look at the heroic structure. This gives you um, a great, some of you may have, um, if you're story nerds, many of you will have read um, Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is a lot of myth and a lot of legend comes from um, this structure and a lot of genre fiction your romance, your sci-fi, your fantasy, your crime tends to be around here. Importantly, every story, the ordinary world is set up and then something weird happens. The world turns upside down. So when we're stuck, how do we link this idea to structure, right? When we're stuck and we go, what do I do? How, what, what can we think about structure? The, best advice I can give you is to think about probably, probably around 70% of the time, your issue is going to be that your rising action feels stilted or that you've plateaued, right? Nine times out of 10, writers are doing awful things to their characters. Story is about characters going through something awful. <laughs> a lot of the time. And that might be COVID. That might be the boringness, the mundanity of COVID or the awfulness of COVID and the pain and grief that comes with COVID or the funny, weird, surprising things that come with COVID, right? But if you're stuck in your structure, you can go, what's the next worst thing that can happen? What if I just hit the dial a bit? What is the next worst thing that can happen to this character? And it might be as simple as they spill coffee on themselves in a scene, but that gets you a new interaction or it might be something as awful as they get a phone call and something terrible has happened right what's the next best thing that could happen is your other option your character can have a little win they can have a little oh that's and open up new plot possibilities that gets you that rising action what is my inciting incident or climax some of you may struggle with those two points and it's really hard to construct a story without at least a vague notion of the climax and you should really know what the inciting incident is right can, can either be pushed out further or do they need to be brought closer together? Can you edit stuff from this middle bit, right? What is that? Can you identify what those points are quite cleanly? Because those are your two tent pegs that you can then bounce around. Have I turned the world upside down? A lot of the time, writers, editors, their lead piece of feedback tends to go, be, you can go further. You can go lean further into the idea. What, how, how can you make things interesting? If you're writing a story about your cat, then what happens if it is from the cat's point of view? What happens if the cat gets into a dialogue with their own shadow? I don't know, weird things, right? What happens if you suddenly find that your cat can talk a little bit, whatever? What's going to be that special source? How can you turn the world upside down that's going to take it to a notch above where it's going to, oh my God, the boy is a wizard or the cat is telepathic, right? <laughs> Whatever way you can find through it. Okay, redrafting. Here's the big thing. So congratulations, you've made it through, right? You've got a first draft. And for many people, a first draft may be a magnum opus. It may be this ridiculously beautiful, long thing. And for some of us, it might be, mm, here's a thousand words. Here's a couple of bullet points that I couldn't be asked writing and I'm not too sure about. And here's another thousand words, right? That might be your first draft and that's okay. Everyone's allowed a seat at the table. How do you get it to the place where it's the best version of itself it can be? Right, drunk, edit sober is Ernest Hemingway's advice. I wouldn't take that advice other than the implication behind that line is that you are in a certain state of mind when you're writing 
And you do need to be in quite a different state of mind when you're editing. It's a different part of the brain. Before editing, you need to be honest with yourself. You need to go, am I actually ready to be critical of this work? And that's a big question. Is it still too close to me? Do I want to make it better or do I just want to feel better about myself? A lot of writers write draft zero and first draft. And I did this all the time when I was starting out. Give it to as many people as possible because I want feedback. I want you to just tell me what you think, which is a really useless question to ask anyone because of course the person in that position doesn't have much option other than to go it's great or worse it's not that great both responses don't actually help you right a lot of the time what you're doing then is that you just want to feel validated which is entirely valid right entirely valid but see if you can give that validation to yourself go i'm proud of this i did this i accomplished this and i feel good i made a creative thing and it's a nice feeling to have but if you want it to be the best version of yourself, it can, it does mean that you have to kind of be open and critical. What will help is that if you set a goal or intention for the work is that I want this to be worthy of being publishing, you know, in a, in an institution, in an institution like Frankston Art Center. I know that a lot of people are going to read this. So I want it to be the best version of itself that it can possibly be. Right? Take your first draft throw out 10%. That's Stephen King's advice. Um, if you're a young writer, this is me being very generalized here, but if you're a young writer, if you're age, you know, if you're below 18 or even if you're below 25, most of the time, those young writers struggle with word length. And then something happens where people get very verbose when they get older and they feel comfortable writing at great length. Either way, in either format, actually, a lot of the time you can be more articulate and concise in what you're saying. Because in your first draft, part of your job is that you're writing to figure out what the story is. So you're finding it as you go along, which means that some there are sentences that generally repeat themselves or there's ideas that you go, oh, that scene, the characters are saying the same thing in that scene. So you can cut. So here's a few golden rules to live by, right? Start late, finish early. That's your idea behind your story and each scene. What is the latest I can possibly get into this interaction or this moment? And what is the earliest that I can get out, right? The latest being don't enter the room when characters are going, put the kettle on, how was your day? Oh, not too bad, how was yours? Yeah, good. Oh, by the way, I don't think we should see each other anymore. That's the start of your scene. Cut everything else beforehand. You don't need it. Story is about action. Drama is about action, right? And finish early. Get out. Leave the leave the reader going, oh my God, because it's that feeling that you want. I want to turn the page. Or if I finish the book, I want to read what this person's written next. Scenes are rivers, not lakes. They move, right? Um, your chapters, your story has action to it, has forward momentum. And in writing something that's only 500 words, things might be a bit more abstract, a bit more um, symbolic, and you might have motifs or themes that repeat themselves or that you play around, but the same rules still apply. It can't be repetitious, 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 repetitious. You've got to evolve that motif. You've got to find different angles of it and different ways to enter the theme, right? What information is there left to discover? If all the characters, including the reader, know all the information, then there is to know, then that is the end. You've actually got no juice. Someone's got to have a secret. Somebody's got to lie. Things got to have you go. The writer still has some, some other piece of information to give. Helpfully, if I were, for those of you who are visual thinkers, you can draw the story shape. Actually get your writing get some index cards and go, okay, in this beat, this happens. And in this beat, this happens. And plot it out on your wall and then go, I see that it starts there. I thought the inciting incident was there, but now that I look at it, I think the story actually starts moving there. And then it goes around like this and does that and, blah, blah, and kind of does that really quickly and probably too abruptly or it goes down, you know, whatever, but see if you can chart it out like a, like an ECG, like a, like a beat beat where you can see the lifeline of the story and see how it is. And that gives you a kind of different view of how you can shape it. Am I being clear? Here's a really hard lesson to learn. I was a great, 
great fan and still am a great fan of people thinking that I'm very smart and very clever. And because I'm a human being, I want to be loved and liked. Thank you very much. So a lot of my writing had a view in, had a point inside it that was about going, how many words can I use or how pretty can I make this? And there's a place for that, but emphasize being clear over clever. Good writing, actually good writing, whether you're writing about, uh, if you're writing Fifty Shades of Grey or if you're writing War and Peace is about clear, is about your reader going, I can entirely see what this writer is trying to communicate. Even if the writer is trying to be a bit opaque and a bit like secretive and I don't want to tell the reader everything, but still the image that I'm giving, the characters that I'm giving you, everything is clear, over clever, right? It's okay to use a simpler word and a simpler sentence structure. You know, look at Cormac McCarthy, who is like, his sentences are da-da-da and da-da-da and da-da-da and da-da-da and. He rarely uses commas, right? Because he's just giving you the image and he's won all sorts of awards and he's a big literary snob, right? And am I being honest? Am I telling the story as honestly as I can? Am I presenting it as honestly as I can? Or am I being dishonest with myself? Is there a different way I can phrase this? Do I want to give it a really sweet, beautiful ending when in fact it's more interesting to give a more bittersweet, bit off colour ending? Mm -hmm. Or is it, um, I'm just, I've got a message, so I just want to make sure that's Heidi. Thanks, Heidi. I need to take your questions. So um, am I being honest? Am I being really clear on what I want to write? So that's me. Ha ha. Final slide. So listen, guys, that was a super crash course. Let me get out of here. Um, Thank you. I will say because you're right. I will say just quickly because we have such limited time. Um, if you want to talk to me more, the easiest way to talk to me is to go to my website and you can join my mailing list there. And I do see if you reply to those emails, I see them and uh, I'm always happy to talk to people. But that's me. <laughs> That's very true. David is always incredibly responsive um, to people when we've done workshops. So if you do have other questions, but we do have a little bit of time left. Um, firstly, I'm just going to quickly say that, um, so all of the things that David's talked through tonight, including the slides, um, which he didn't actually attach to the email he sent me earlier. I'm just publicly shaming him. Um, and he'll resend me that email. Um, so I will send that to you. <laughs> He's naughty. I will send that, but that's okay because I wasn't going to send it till the morning anyway. So tomorrow morning um, on the email that you registered, um, that you sent me uh, for the information to the Zoom link, I will be emailing the recording of this, power, uh, this presentation. I'll also be sending you that Spotify link and some information about what's on that because I know some people might not have Spotify or access to it. Um, and the other thing I'll also send through, uh, what, did it, what have I missed, slides, Spotify link and the recording. I'll send that all through to you. Also, I'll direct you to how to submit to stories at the end of the line. So I know that some of you have already submitted. Um, we are certainly happy for you to submit again if this has inspired you to go, oh, I want to rewrite. Or the other thing you might want to do is in the sense of redrafting is you might want to take what you've already submitted um, and submit it again. Um, and that's also absolutely fine. Um, just shoot me through an email and let me know you'd like me to take the second submission rather than the first one. Just get in contact and we can have a chat about it. The submissions are all going to be published into an anthology, which is available for our community. It's also going to be part of an exhibition next year. Um, and we're really excited. We've had some beautiful, we've had about 22 submissions so far, some really amazing pieces of work. Please don't be shy in sharing a moment that's important to you or something that's important to you as a story. This idea is that it's about a community voice and it's, I think, what David's captured really beautifully tonight is the idea that we all have a story to tell. Um, but I'm going to stop talking um, because I am going to open up for questions. Now, we've kind of got... Uh, this might be a crazy idea. People are saying thank you in the chat, which is really lovely. Um, but I'm going to say, if you'd like to share your video so we can, I'm going to stop recording because um